Hi, y'all. Welcome to your Chapter 9, AP Statistics Video Number 1. We've talked about correlation, scatter plots, linear regression, and now we're going to talk about regression wisdom, how to use all this wisely. Uh, linear regression, actually it should say, works only for linear models. That sounds obvious, but when you fit a regression, you can't take it for granted. You have to look at your data. So you want to look at the original scatter plot, which you want to have a linear form. However, a curve for relationship between two variables might not be apparent when looking at the scatter plot alone, especially if the curve is really subtle but it will be more obvious in a plot of the residuals. So you want to look at a residual plot. Now, again, with the scatter plot of the data, you want to, to see something that, that's centered around a linear um, pattern. For a um, scatter plot of residuals or residual plot, you want to see just kind of a random cloud. You don't want there to be any discernible pattern among those residuals. Um, so, in other words, you want to see nothing in the plot of the residuals. Okay, the scatter plot of residuals against duration of imperial penguin dives holds a surprise. Remember the problem in your book that they discussed? You've got the dive heart rate and then the duration of the dive. Okay, um, the linearity assumption says we should not see a pattern, but instead there is a, a bend. Okay, so we'll read the second bullet point in just a second, but look down at the two graphs. Look closely, the one with the red dots, um, just like it was in your book, um, on the horizontal we've got duration, and on the vertical we've got dive heart rate. So that is our actual data. Uh, so in there you can see that it's somewhat linear. I mean, there appears to be a general pattern um, with a negative association. It seems to be a somewhat constant rate maybe some leveling off there and um, it really is kind of a curved relationship but i can see how someone would look at that and think it was straight enough but when you look at the residuals the graph with the green dots that has duration across the bottom and then it has residuals on the vertical um, you can see that the curve is more pronounced so the pattern because a linear model can't account for that curvature the curvature is going to be more pronounced in the residuals because the residuals what error is left over and so it's going to exaggerate that pattern because the curve is left over you can't account for it in a line okay so even though it means checking the straight enough condition after you find the regression which seems backwards it's always good to check your scatter plot of your residuals or residual plot for bends that you might have overlooked in the original scatter plot. No regression analysis is complete without a display of the residuals to check that the linear model is reasonable. Residuals often reveal subtleties that were not clear from a plot of the original data. Sometimes the subtleties we see are additional details that help confirm or refine our understanding. Sometimes they reveal violations of the regression conditions that require our attention, as in the emperor and um, pigeon example. It's a good idea to look at both a histogram of the residuals and a scatter plot of the residuals versus um, the predicted values, or you know the the um, x values too, but certainly versus predicted values is fine. In the regression, and um, in, in the regression of uh, predicting calories from sugar content in cereals, we see the following. So we've got that histogram on the left of the residuals, and you can see it's centered uh, around just a slight positive value there. Um, and then there's another mode uh, just in the slight negative values, but then there's two small modes at the on the toward the ends of either tail. One down here um, that begins at negative 45 and one over here in the middle between 22.5 and 45. Um, the small modes in the histogram are marked with different colors and symbols in the residual plot above and it's asking what you see. So here's the um, this, the residuals that were around the negative 45, they're in red over here, and the ones that were between 22.5 and 45 are over here in green with X's. And so they seem to be little clusters there, with most of the cereal there in blue, and then you've got kind of separate groups there for each of those. 
An examination of the residuals often leads us to discover groups of observations that are different from the rest. When we discover that there is more than one group in a regression, we may decide to analyze the group separately using a different model for each group. Here's an important unstated condition for fitting models. All the data must come from the same group. Otherwise, you're, you're trying to model something that doesn't really make sense. When we discover that there is more than one group in a regression, neither modeling the groups together nor modeling them apart is necessarily correct. You must determine what makes the most sense. In the following example, we see that modeling them apart makes sense. The figure shows regression lines fit to calories and sugar for each of the three cereals, uh, cereal shelves in a supermarket. So you can see uh, the blue is shelf one, the red is shelf two, and then the green is shelf three. So you've actually got three different models based on the shelf. And a lot of times people put like all the kids cereal on the bottom shelf. And so those tend to be more sugary versus fatty. Um, and then some cereals like uh, granolas and different things, um, especially cereals with nuts in them, they may not have a lot of sugar in them, but th nuts have a lot of fat, good fat, but fat. And so the calories um, are going to come from fat more than from sugar. So sometimes you've got different groups, but little kid sugary cereal, oh yeah, that's going to um, have high sugar or high calorie content in it. Linear models give a predicted value for each case in the data. Okay, so for every x value in the data, you have a y hat as well as a y. Okay, you have, remember your y is your observed y value, and then the y hat is the model predicted value for a particular x value. We cannot assume that a linear relationship in the data exists beyond the range of the data. Okay, sometimes people might go a little bit out, but you certainly don't want to go very far. The farther the new x value is from the mean in x, the less trust we should place in the predicted value. Once we venture into new X territory, such a prediction is called an extrapolation. Extrapolations are dubious because they require the additional and very questionable assumption that nothing about the relationship between X and Y changes, even at, at extreme values of X. Extrapolations can get you into deep trouble, and you're better off not making extrapolations. But let me just tell you, every you know people do this all the time. Okay, um, one extrapolation that people do is looking at when they think Social Security is going to collapse. The latest information I've heard is that it should collapse in, by the year 2035, which, by the way, is the year I turned 65. So um, that's why that sticks in my head, because it's like, great, okay, as soon as I turn 65, there, there won't be any more Social Security. But that is all assuming that... Um, the current trends are going to continue, okay? And there, there, there's no reason to necessarily believe that. Maybe we're going to get a big, you know, great economic time ahead of us. We could, uh, something terrible could happen in the next couple of years and Social Security could go bankrupt, you know, by 2015. We just don't know. Here is a time plot of the Energy Information Administration predictions and actual oil, pri oil barrel prices. How did forecasters do? So uh, the reddish, orangey kind of um, information there is price in $2,005. And let's see, the green and the blue are AE098 and AE099. I think those are the predictions for the for the couple of years. And yeah, the prices of oil are much, much higher than what was predicted. Extrapolation is always dangerous, but when the x variable in the model is time, extrapolation becomes an attempt to appear in the future, like with the whole Social Security collapse question. Knowing that extrapolation is dangerous doesn't stop people. The temptation to see in the future is hard to resist, and it's almost like our electorate demands it of politicians, um, but they can't see in the future. Here's some uh, more realistic advice. If you must extrapolate into the future, at least don't believe that the prediction will come true. Okay, just know that you're, you're doing something kind of dicey. All right, so outliers leverage and influence. Outlying points can strongly influence a regression. 
if you think about it, that makes sense because it's all based on means and um, standard deviations and means and standard deviations are highly influenced by, by outliers. So it makes sense that regression as a whole would be influenced by outliers. Even a single point far from the body of data can dominate the analysis. Any point that stands away from the others can be called an outlier and deserves your special attention. The following scatter plot shows that something was awry in Palm Beach County, Florida during the 2000 presidential election. Okay, so all the other counties there are in blue and then Palm Beach County is the, the red X. The red line shows the effects that one unusual point can have on a regression. So the red line is the regression with the outlier in it and then the blue line is the regression without the outlier in it. The linear model doesn't fit points with large residuals very well because there's going to be a huge, yeah, obviously it doesn't because that's why there is a large residual. Because they seem to be different from the other cases, it's important to, sp to pay special attention to the points with large residuals. A data point can be unusual if its x value is far from the mean of x value. Such points are said to ha have high leverage. Okay, they're, ha they're said to have high leverage. And so um, this kind of goes with the idea of Archimedes when he said, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. And the idea there is if he could get enough leverage, he could move the earth. So if a value is far enough away from the x values, the mean of the x values, it can move the whole regression. It draws the regression to itself. If it doesn't follow the general pattern, it uses its influence, and it's called an influential point. If it, if it falls in the pattern of the rest, it doesn't um, use its influence because it doesn't need to. It, everybody else is in line with it. Um, a point with high leverage has the potential to change the regression line. We say that a point is influential if omitted if omitting it from the analysis gives a very different model. Just like a person with influence goes in and changes like the atmosphere of a team or a room or whatever group, the point when it's put in, it changes the model. Okay, that's why it's called an influential point. Um, okay, the extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily large shoe size gives the data uh, point very high leverage wherever the IQ is the line will follow remember we looked at IQ and in the book they talk about Bozo the Clown and if Bozo the Clown has a high IQ then the model is going to have a positive um, slope to it there's going to be a positive association if Bozo the Clown has a very low IQ then it's going to drag the model down with it to where the sign of the association changes and that's because if you remove it, you'll see, if you remove just that one point, you'll see there is no association at all between shoe size and IQ among adults. And so, um, yeah, that influential point is able to um, have a tremendous effect on the regression line. When we investigate an unusual point, we often learn more about the situation than we, we would have learned from the model alone. You cannot simply delete unusual points from the data. You can, however, fit a model with and without these points as long as you examine and discuss the true regression models to understand how they differ. All right, a warning. Influential points can hide in a plot of residuals. Because they pull the line close to themselves, all points with high leverage do that. Uh, they often have very small residuals. You'll see the influential points more easily in scatter plots of the original data or by finding, by finding a regression model with and without the points. So to find points with high influence, you don't look in the residual plot, you look in the scatter plot. Okay, we're going to come back in video two and pick up with lurking variables and causation. So I'm going to say goodbye to you for right now, and I will talk to you again in just a minute.